So today we're going to talk about special issues in assessing English language learners. So let's start off with um, a little background on English language learners in general. So let's see. So the first thing is what modifications might we need for English language learners in assessment? And again, we're going to focus exclusively on um, assessment in this lecture because that's the focus of this course. And I know that you guys all have many classes on ELLs. So we're not going to go into a lot of detail here because you'll get it if you haven't already yet in other courses. Um, a lot of these um, modifications will be the same that you um, we talked about last week with um, students with special needs. So a few facts. It's the fastest growing subpopulation in U.S. schools. Um, in the United States, it's about 9.7%. Um, it's about 8.8% of Florida school populations and about 3% of Duval County schools. Um, and the reason it's so much less in Duval than the rest of Florida is because the majority of the English language population um, in English language learner population in Florida is farther south. Um, we know that the inclusion or the supportive inclusion model is the best way to educate the LLs. So we're looking for um, immersion um, in the language with that facilitated support. Um, but we also know that it takes between five to seven years to reach full school proficiency in English. Um, but they're not exempt from the NCLB guidelines. So some factors that have influenced assessment, we have language and literacy factors, so language dependent skills, and that language deficits um, can mask knowledge. So I might know a lot about science, but if I can't tell you what I know, then, um, then you won't know what I know, right? Um, and it can weaken the validity of assessments. So if I'm trying to assess what you know about math, that it's dependent upon your knowledge of English, then I'm also assessing your English skills, not just what you know about math. So we really have to interpret um, our assessments in light of that language use as well. And we know that listening, speaking, reading, and writing develop unevenly, so that um, we might be at different levels for all four of those areas in language development. And we know that every day an academic language develops differently or separately so that we, I might be fluent in everyday language. I might be able to hold a conversation with you in English, but that doesn't mean that I understand what's going on in a classroom in that academic language that takes longer to develop. That's what really takes us five to seven years to develop. So things that influence assessment, those educational background factors. So knowing that students who are coming to the United States will have had a wide variety of educational experiences, um, and that varies greatly. So what they've been taught, even just within the United States, kids that move around might have been taught different things. So when they learn about world history versus US history, and obviously people not from Florida didn't learn Florida history, right? And obviously people who didn't grow up in the United States probably didn't learn United States history, right? Um, and then what sciences they've learned, um, what content's been covered, that can vary greatly by culture. Um, familiarity with school procedures, so things like how to use a locker and how to line up, how to raise your hand, those kinds of things might be really different. Um, and assessment procedures in particular, so how to take a multiple choice test, those test taking skills that we take for granted in the United States may not have been taught or may not have been emphasized in other countries. I mean, a wide variety of cultural factors, so mainstream American culture, so especially when we're thinking about things like um, reading comprehension assessments, we take for granted that students have a familiarity with these things when they may not, right? So reading about life on a farm with cows and chickens, um, that's all pretty familiar to maybe American culture, but may not be familiar to students from other, other cultures, and it's important to think about that. Um, and even things like George Washington or Abraham Lincoln, things that common names for us obviously wouldn't be common for students from other cultures. Um, even the norms of taking standardized tests. So the things like the things that we have to explicitly teach about standardized testing, like multiple choice um, answers and all of those item types. We want to make sure that we've taught our English language learners, our students from other cultures. Um, the background knowledge for the reading, and then also thinking about the ways in which communities and plagiarism and cheating are viewed in other cultures varies greatly. So um, students from more communal um, cultures don't necessarily have the same views about, let's say, sharing answers. So if I know something, why would I not tell my friend? Why would that knowledge be secret? Why would I not share that with someone else? And that's a real, that's a cultural value that might be unique to the United States or unique to Western cultures. Um, and also how we value the type of knowledge. 
So in other cultures, memorizing facts and memorizing entire passages is really highly valued. So to go to a test and be able to recite exactly what the test book, textbook said would be a highly priced skill. And that's not really what we're looking for in English, right? We would call that plagiarism. That's using someone else's words, right? So we would want to see that synthesis and that analysis of that knowledge in a different way. And so it's really important that we make sure that we've explicitly stated what we're looking for in for and those cross-cultural communications and really express to students and be understanding and, and take into account culture when we're thinking about the expectations for, for students. Um, identifying difficulties for ELLs and classroom assessments. There might be difficulty in comprehending the test language. So can they read what the test says? So things like compl complex sentence structures can be difficult. Um, idiomatic expressions, so things that um, aren't the literal truth but have a subtle meaning. Um, I think the classic example we give here is like as raining cats and dogs, which I'm not sure would be on the directions of a test, but thinking about the ways in which we use language that might not have a direct translation. Um, jargon and te technical terms, and again, using the language of the discipline is great. Like I want to use the word photosynthesis if I taught that in class, right? But trying to avoid really overly technical or jargon terms that haven't been taught or aren't part of the vocabulary for the class, we want to try to avoid. Um, double negatives. We talked a lot about this in, de in developing the test, but it's going to be especially important for our English language learners. Um, unclear organization um, in our, my writing style and the writing style of the test and the formation of the test is going to have a greater impact on an English language learner. Um, we want to make sure that the, the vocabulary level is at or below grade level, that the sentence complexity again is at or below grade level, that the sentences are clear. We might provide definitions or glossaries for students. Um, we can also provide a, a dictionary for translation, but sometimes that dictionary can be cumbersome. So sometimes it's actually more helpful to provide a glossary um, or in addition to a glossary of just the terms we're using on that test. Um, that we link that content to prior knowledge so that we're not pulling things out of the blue, that we've really scaffold that understanding and learning with clear organization, clear examples. Um, you know, when we were talking about modifications for special education students, we were talking about um, we might need to lower that level of thinking for students to accommodate for students with um, maybe intellectual disorders. Um, but English language learners, we don't, we should not be changing the level of thinking that's required. We should just be changing the level of language. So we should be asking them to think and analyze and synth synthesize that high level. We just want to make sure that we're allowing them to access that through their native language or through English language supports. And we make sure the directions are clear and that we've checked to make sure that they understand what's being asked um, and that the options are reasonable and balanced because again, obviously wrong answers will be less obvious for our English language learners. Um, identifying, Identif they'll, in addition to difficulty in comprehension, they'll have difficulty with expression. So we wanna take into account poor spelling, poor grammar, improper word choice. So just using a word that's not quite right, not quite the right word in choices. Um, we often see a lack of variety of expressions. They use the same kind of sentence structure over and over again. Um, in fact, what's interesting is as students get more proficient with English, we oftentimes see more mistakes in spelling and grammar as they try out different varieties of expression. They don't always get it right. So in the beginning, they might say a lot of things like, I like this, I like that, this is good, this is great. Um, and then as they try to try to convey more complex ideas and use different verb tenses, they're more apt to make mistakes. Um, poor organization in the overall content of the test or of their organization of writing. We want to make sure that all of these things don't indicate a lack of comprehension. So when we're grading or assessing this work, we want to separate their comprehension of the content and the ideas they're communicating from their language expression. And we might want to assess these both separately or not assess the language expression depending on the content area or the constructs that we're assessing. Um, it also might take them more time to complete a test. And what we want to remember here again is we can give them more time, but think about trying to write or think in another language. That's also cognitively very difficult. 
So we might also want to chunk that time for them and give them breaks or give them shorter assignments rather than just giving them more time. Um, there's a lack of cultural and content knowledge. So depending on prior schooling and grade level knowledge, I mean that culturally assume knowledge that's not explicitly taught, we might need to make very explicit for them. And trying to provide these culturally neutral contacts for test items, which is we can't remove culture entirely from any context because it's so embedded in who we are, but trying to make things a little less culturally embedded may be helpful. Um, unfamiliarity, unfamiliarity with different test types. So especially things that are really um, centered in our Western world, we want to think about maybe explaining and providing examples for these types of problems. Um, when we want to think about the emotional stress that might be accompanying um, taking an, an assessment in another language, so the linguistic and cultural adjustments that are required, and then being sensitive to the anxiety that might be produced from that. So that considerable effort to process the stress that might be involved that might contribute to maybe shorter attention spans, greater fatigue, greater anxiety that all would contribute to lower performance on assessments. And frustration, think about knowing something and not being able to express that to anyone. Um, all of that combined could lead to just a really frustrating experience as a student and just being sensitive to that as a teacher. Um, again, a lot of the things we already talked about with special education would be effective um, in test format and test taking. Um, and interpreting and grading, really thinking about that difference between language expression and comprehension and um, and also the content that we're trying to assess. Um, the format, we can, um, we want to not dilute the content, but demonstrate their content knowledge through other means, perhaps. Um, providing customized dictionaries, clarifying and simplifying those distractors, especially on multiple choice items, limiting those number of choices, avoiding words like always, never, not, except, because those are words that um, without context can be easy to miss and avoiding those double negatives at all costs for English language learners because they're interpreted so differently by language. The format, um, we might, for constructed response, especially essays, we might try to depend rather on long essays using things like graphic organizers, outlines, or oral responses if their speaking has developed prior to their writing, and that might be individual per student. Providing a word bank to help them with those types of open response items, and providing models or examples or sentence stems, so giving them the beginning or the structure of the sentence for them to fill in instead, and thinking about how else we might provide scaffolding for them to provide that language that they might need. Um, we also, here's another wide variety of other ways they could demonstrate knowledge aside from the traditional testing formats, which may not be the best ways for to capture what they know. Um, we could give them extra time, but knowing that that takes that that takes that extra cognitive load instead, we might think about that flexible scheduling instead. And thinking about comfortable test taking environments, including oral and written directions, so they can see and hear those directions in both. Um, even including pictures to accompany the directions might be helpful or demonstrating um, using gestures. When we're providing feedback, we want to think about that content and that language separately. Um, and weighing those objectives for content and language accordingly, depending on your content area. And focusing on that content and that progress rather than the product and the language when possible. We know that ELLs develop proficiency in different levels. <laughs> um, that we can label those levels. And I know that these might vary a little bit from the kinds of levels that you learned about in ELL in your TESOL classes. Um, I like including level seven, which was when you've never been limited English proficient, so a native English speaker. So that level six where you're fully proficient, um, we still might want to consider language when we see a delay because even though they've graduated from their ELL program or their TESOL program in school, they still might not have acquired fully that academic English that we would expect. So we still might want to be considering um, their ELL status when we might see difficulties with them in school. And knowing that they could be at different levels for listening, speaking, writing, and reading, um, each of those areas can be developing at a different rate. So um, content, oh, so now I want to talk a little bit about this content knowledge assessment that's due this week. Um, just um, so you know what I'm expecting for the assignment. 
um, and this, you're going to you're going to take your college content knowledge assessments and um, that you developed um, last week, and you're going to um, use it and adapt it to two neat, two different groups. You're keeping the same learning goals, but I want you to adapt the test to assess these learning goals with validity while trying to minimize the effect of the special group. So you're going to have um, three headings, general information, students with exceptionalities, and English language learners. So for general information, you can copy and paste this from your original report. So you want to know what your construct is, what the standards were, and what your learning objectives are. This is just to remind me what you were doing, right? Then for your students with exceptionalities, um, I want you to take one area from IDEA. So go back to the PowerPoint that I had on students with exceptionalities and pick one. First, provide a description of how you'll adapt your test for a student with exceptionality. Um, tell me which area you're thinking about. Be as specific as you can. Then provide a one paragraph explanation of how your adaptions are a valid measurement of your construct while trying to minimize the effect of the disability. So again, thinking about, okay, so if I had a math test and I was doing with dyslexia, talk to me about how you can still measure math while trying to try to lower the effect of the reading disability, right? And then revisions. And then you're going to tell, you're actually going to take that test you wrote and show me the revisions, create a revised test um, for the students with exceptionalities. And that can be attached in your um, appendix or as a separate file if you're having trouble making it um, fit within that one file. Then it's adaptations for English language learners. Essentially the same thing. You can specify their language levels in all four categories, listening, speaking, reading, and writing, as well as their native language. So you can think about is this a Spanish speaker or a Chinese speaker, Mandarin, um, which might have really different effects on their language. Um, so again, provide a description of how you'll adapt the test. Tell me about the validity of your test. And then now you're going to create a different revision for your English language learners. So I want this, this to be a different set of revisions. So you're actually going to end up doing two different versions of your original test, one for students with exceptionalities and one for English language learners. And then you're going to explain it. Um, and then finally, you have um, a ref if you have references, you don't necessarily need them. But if you want to include them, maybe from the position papers you read for this module or um, from the textbook, you can. And then you should have in your appendix two different appendices, one for each of your revised instruments. Again, if you're having trouble attaching those instruments within the paper itself, you can attach each of those as separate files. Um, let me know if you have any questions about this assignment. I'm really looking forward to seeing how you're going to take what we've learned this week and apply it to what we are doing. Um, have a great week. Bye.